thrilled to be kicking off with uh, Chip Conley. And Chip Conley is one of the most inspiring and innovative people that uh, I've come across in the last few years, who has built up a business at the age of mid-20s, set up a hotel chain, Joie de Vivre, which became one of the biggest, most successful boutique hotel chains with 20 or 30 different hotels across um, the Bay Area in California. And uh, he's since sold that or sold part of that, uh, has now joined Airbnb as the global head of hospitality and uh, strategy. Uh, but he's also take, he's found time to write a number of books, four or five winning uh, New York Times best-selling uh, books, one of which uh, Katie and I read a couple of years ago as part of our research for a project on innovation in, in the hospitality industry. And it was called Peak, and it was all about how to deliver great experiences uh, for both employees and customers and investors, and some really interesting parallels. And this is what we're trying to do at this event, as we've been talking about earlier today. We heard about the uh, learning from adjacent industries, from the, the healthcare industry, and, and, uh, and now we're going to shift gears a little bit to, to some insights from hospitality. And, and I don't think there's anybody better um, to talk about uh, how to innovate and how to create amazing experiences in hospitality that we all uh, in aging and senior care can learn from. So with that, I'd like you to welcome Chip Conley. Thank you. The clicker there. Right, thank you. Uh, thank you, Stephen. Really appreciate Katie. It's wonderful to be here. Um, when I, I heard the name Aging 2.0 and being that I am twice the age of my cohorts at Airbnb uh, as the employees, I felt like, okay, that's the 2.0 is just you know the multiplication of my age divided by the average age of my fellow workers there. It's also funny that when I joined the company two years ago, it was um, exactly twice the age I was when I started Joie de Vivre. So I'm going to talk a little bit about my own personal story today, but I'm also going to talk about a psychology theory that you could apply to any business. And I'm also going to talk about what it's like to be a disruptor, and then a disrupted, and then a disruptor again. And I'm going to do all this in 20 minutes, and then we're going to have some time for Q&A. So I, that's a lot. I'm going to go through some things really fast today. Uh, if something doesn't make sense to you, ask, ask me in the Q&A. All right. Life and business is all about where we pay our attention. And you're going to see a few pyramids today. And that's because I'm a big believer in Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And what I will tell you is that most companies are really good at figuring out the bottom of the pyramid the basics of life and the basics of business because it's more easily measurable. But the companies that actually excel and transform their industries are those, generally speaking, that actually are playing at the top of the pyramid. That will make a little more sense in a few minutes. I did start my company, as Stephen said, when I was 26 years old in the Tenderloin, a place called the Caravan Lodge. Anybody ever stay at the Caravan Lodge 30 years ago before I bought the place? <laughs> Anybody? Well, of course you wouldn't admit it because it was a pay-by-the-hour motel. It was, <laughs> it was very, very popular. It was really popular at lunchtime, and it did not have a restaurant. Um, so <laughs> Art Norcus is the old band leader who owned the place, and I said, so what's your annual occupancy? He said, 142%. He said, I, I said, he said 142%. I said, that's impossible. He said, Sonny, you have no idea what you're getting yourself into in buying this business. And in fact, I... I decided to call the company Joie de Vivre because that's what he was doing at, at Caravan Lodge. I was creating a lot of joy there. <laughs> now, but that first hotel, or it's a motel, called the Phoenix, um, which has been around for 28 and a half years now. Uh, actually, its 28-year-old uh, grand opening party was two days ago, uh, 28 years ago. I called the company Joie de Vivre because there are very few companies in the world whose mission statement is also the name of the company. And even though Joie de Vivre is a really hard name to pronounce and spell in the United States, and most people don't even know what it means, it's French for joy of life, that was our mission. And there are very few companies whose mission statement is also in the name of the company. Over the course of, wow, 25 years or so of being CEO of that company I founded, um, we became one of the largest boutique hoteliers in the world. We became the second largest in the US. And the truth is, 30 years ago when I started this company, uh, nobody would have called me a disruptor, or Ian Schrager a disruptor, or Bill Kimpton a disruptor. We were sort of the early stage of boutique hoteliers. But what's happened over time is what you see in terms of disruption 
something that's a disruption is something that has a long-term trend attached to it. And I got to tell you, aging is a long-term trend. And for us in the boutique hotel business, what's been fascinating to see over time is just how many of the big global hotel chains who initially actually hated us. In fact, there's a great Gandhi quote that I gave at, at Airbnb when I first joined. And I said, this is us in the hotel industry. First, they, this is what Gandhi said back in 1945 about the, the British. He said, first, they ignore you, then they ridicule you, then they fight you, and then you win. And the winning in the boutique hotel business is that, frankly, that Starwood created W. And Intercontinental just bought Kimpton a few months ago. And basically, every big hotel company in the world now has a boutique collection within the company. So disruption is about usually being an outsider coming in and seeing an opportunity. Uh, Ian Schrager, Bill Kempton, and I, were none of us came from the hotel industry. So over time, I've been a disruptor, and then I was the disrupted. And this is at the, my part of my talk I'm going to talk about where I got disrupted. I got disrupted and Joie de Vivre got disrupted in 2001. And it was actually when I wrote my first book. I, so Stephen, thanks for talking about my books. I love writing books. Um, I wrote a book called The Rebel Rules, Daring to Be Yourself in Business. Richard Branson, a big disruptor, uh, wrote the foreword to the book. But the little private uh, reality in my life at that time was that my company was in a lot of trouble. We had 21 hotels. We ultimately created 52 boutique hotels. But at that time, we had 21 hotels only in the Bay Area. And between 2001 and 2006, the Bay Area experienced the largest percentage revenue drop in hotels in the history of American hotels since World War II, other than by natural disaster. So we were in a big troubled period. And the reason was we had a dot-com bust. We had 9-11. And after 9-11, it was very hard for people to travel and go, to, especially if you're going to travel in the US from outside. And so gateway cities in the US, like a San Francisco and Silicon Valley, um, were hard, we didn't, it was harder for international travelers to come here. Uh, what else happened? We had, we had a war. We had a recession. We had a, war with, oh, we had a war with the Iraqis. And then we had a war with the French. Do you remember the war with the French? No. I know. It's a long time ago. What, what is that? Freedom fries. Freedom fries. That's right. We stopped eating French fries in this country. Well, actually, that's not true. We will never stop eating French fries in this country. We just called them freedom fries, and we started boycotting French companies. And that's when I realized I should never have called my company Joie de Vivre, <laughs> because I started getting emails from places like Alabama and Danville. And, um, <laughs> They would write me and say, wait a minute, you know, we hate you Frenchies. And I'd write back and I'd say, wait a minute, we, we're not a French company. We're, in fact, an American company. We're based in San Francisco. And they'd write back, San Francisco, question mark, oh, that's worse. Uh, so, <laughs> so yeah, San Francisco's left of Paris. Um, this is where I went from being the guy on the left, because all of our hotels were in the Bay Area, which was the best hotel market during the dot-com boom, to being the guy on the right. Uh, where all of our hotels were in the worst market in the country. Something else happened during that time. Joie de Vivre, my company, got disrupted. We got disrupted by these guys. In essence, the nature of how people bought their travel went, went from being direct with us to going to all of these online travel agencies. So it was that during that dark time that I ended up in a local bookstore at, that used to be at the corner of uh, Powell and Post. It's a Borders bookstore that got disrupted. It's not there anymore. Um, and I ended up sitting on the floor for four hours reading, oh, well, this is the disrupted. I was a disrupting force for a while. Then I was a disrupted force. And when I was that disrupted force, I ended up went to, going to a local bookstore. And I started in the business section of the bookstore. And I realized within about five minutes of being there, I was in the wrong section of the bookstore. So I went to the self-help psychology part of the bookstore, which is where CEOs go when they have no money left. Uh, and I was there, sat for four hours on the floor, and I read a couple of Abe Maslow's books. Now, I took one psychology class in college, so I'm not a big psychology fanatic, but I was fascinated by Maslow in college uh, because Maslow was the good guy. He was the guy who talked about psychology as being a, a way to actually help people enliven themselves. Uh, instead of psychologists, he's the one who also said, uh, if the only tool you have is a hammer, everything starts to look like a nail. He's the first person who said that. Uh, and he said it because he said to the psychology profession, we have gotten so used to thinking people are broken, all we do is create psychology theories that are around broken people. And so he basically created something that, you know, you all know about this, I'm sure you're a smart crowd. 
he created Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So I was sitting on the floor until they told me to actually buy the books, and I had to go buy the books, and I did, and I took them home, and then I started asking this weird question, which is like, well, if companies are full of humans, uh, and humans have a hierarchy of needs, couldn't a company have a hierarchy of needs? Or, or couldn't we become a self-actualized company where peak experiences would occur? And that's when I took the idea of our hotel guests, for you in the seniors industry, however you're serving seniors, you could do this. In a few slides, I will show you an aging 2.0 slide that I think is a slide you could consider for your customers. Um, we took it and we said, this is what we're creating. Um, and so by doing that, I was able to get my senior team on board to say, OK, let's look at, at applying Maslow's hierarchy needs to our organization, and frankly, to our three most important constituencies, our employees, our customers, and our investors. So we took the idea of Maslow's Pyramid, and we distilled it down to three basic themes. Because there's really three themes in life. I mean, think about this. This could be everything from your family vacation this summer to a date you're going to have on Saturday night. You could have a survival date, a succeed date, or a transformational date. <laughs> it's, well, I won't even get into the details of that. Um, but they line up with the five levels of Maslow's Pyramid, with levels two, one and two being uh, survival, levels three and four, social and belonging needs, uh, social belonging and esteem needs being as how you feel successful in life. And when you're in that state of self-actualization of being all you can be, uh, that's when transformation occurs. So we took this paradigm, the transformation pyramid, uh, which we created uh, at Joie de Vivre, and we applied it to our three most important uh, constituencies. This is where you're going to look at me and say, Chip, this is a longer speech. You're only up there for 20 minutes. This is way too much information. You're right. And so you'll have some opportunity to ask some questions. But let me just quickly give you a sense that this, this is the survival need for an employee. That's a success need. And that's the transformational need for an employee, feeling a sense of meaning. That's, the, that's for a customer. That's for an investor. What was phenomenal is during that period of time between 2001 and 2006, when the Bay Area hotel business basically fell apart, it, average hotel in, in Silicon Valley dropped 52% revenue. Imagine your industry dropping 52% as a, an average. Average in San Francisco dropped 25%. We tripled in size during that time. This is why. We basically said, how do we move from this survival state and address getting the basics made, uh, fixed so that we can move up that pyramid. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. You can ask some questions on it if you like. And there's a, you know, there's a book, of course, that actually talks about it. But let me actually go to this uh, pyramid, because in some ways, it's fundamental to every great company. Every great company I've seen, including Airbnb, I'm going to you know, give a call out to the company, because when I joined Airbnb, I was like, hey, I'm retired. I, I sold my company. I'm not ready to go work really hard. Um, but what I saw there very, very quickly was that this was a company that was investing a lot in culture and wanted to, in essence, turn this pyramid on its head. And, or to use a Southwest Airlines analogy, Southwest Airlines, an, you know, the airline industry is a broken industry, but somehow Southwest Airlines for over 40 years has been a bit of a beacon in a bad industry. They have said, the, the CEO of Southwest Airlines, and I've spent some time together looking at, this, at the peak model, he said, our, our model here is not a pyramid, it's a square. But for the average company, two-thirds of the average employees, I'm sorry, two-thirds of the employees at the average company in the United States actually think of their work as a job based upon not asking you, do you have a job, a career, or calling, but asking questions that help decipher which of those levels you, you, you uh, are on. About 25% of us in the American workplace have a career, and about 5 to 10% of us have a calling. So what's a calling versus a job? A calling is something that energizes you and is purpose-driven. It means that you, when you're doing the work you're doing, Somehow, the leadership of the organization has constantly reminded you the impact you're having and the meaning you're having in work by what you're doing and at work by who you're doing it for. And making that connection of what you do on a daily basis. Now, if you want to understand this a little bit more, I, wrote, I gave a TED Talk five years ago. And the first slide of my TED Talk is Vivian, an, a Vietnamese housekeeper who actually came 28 years ago 
and join me at the Phoenix Hotel, and she still is there 28 years later, and she cleans toilets for a living. She cleans guest rooms. That's what she does. Is there meaning in that? No. Is there a calling in that? No. But we found with Vivian and with so many of the employees in our company, and this is what's so true in, in healthcare and aging, is it has a lot to do with not the task, because someone who has a job is task focused. They are task focused, and they're actually not energized by the work, they're depleted by it. Vivian, what, what gave her, what we found that gave her energy was having a sense of creating a community amongst the other maids and housekeepers on the staff and having a sense that they were serving someone else and building a relationship with our guests. So instead of actually having her just being sort of like invisible, we actually, during that downturn when everything was going wrong, we would have guests once a month come in at every one of our hotels and tell their stories about why they loved staying at that hotel. It cost us nothing. But the guests came in and told their stories and told about specific people like Vivian saying, here's why I love Vivian. And all of a sudden, Vivian had a sense of calling more than a job. OK, let's keep going. So if I were to actually give you a suggest an aging 2.9, it has a question mark here because you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not smart enough to know whether this is right. But this could be a hierarchy of needs for people who are getting older in life, including myself. What is, in fact, I'm going to talk about myself on this pyramid in a moment. But this could be a hierarchy of needs for someone who actually is over 50, over 60, over 70. Now, at the top of this is language that I've created called modern elder. And I actually really believe that that is what we will all aspire to in the 21st century, is to be a modern elder. But before I actually tell you what I think a modern elder is, I want to give you a quote. There's a wonderful African uh, writer named Maladome Some. Pretty close, but not exactly the way he would pronounce it. And here's what he said. Here's what he said about uh, modern life and the, mod the, the way we live life today. Let me get my glasses out here. This is where you know, I'm an elder. I've got, I got the glasses for sure. Um, he said, where ritual is absent, the young ones are restless or violent, there are no real elders, and the grown-ups are bewildered. How many of you are bewildered? <laughs> um, modern life, you know, modern life is a funny thing. In modern life, there isn't a lot of ritual. It's multi-generational, that's for sure. In modern life, we've gotten to a place where, in many ways, the elders are forgotten. They're sort of invisible. Uh, and in modern life, more than anything, uh, there's a, this very strange thing happening demographically where uh, you know better than I do that we're going to live probably 10 years older than our parents, potentially. We may retire younger. We don't know how we're going to pay for that because we don't have pensions anymore. And what I've learned, I guess, in my own personal experience as a modern elder at Airbnb is I joined this place two years ago, and I didn't know a damn thing about technology. I joined a technology company at age 52. I had been for 25 years the CEO of a, of a hotel company. I was, I was basic, my boss was someone 21 years younger than me. The founders are between 21 and 23 years younger than me. There's three founders. So what did I learn in the last two years about what it means to be a modern elder? I'll give you three key, key lessons I've learned. First lesson is be constantly curious. Be constantly curious. And a lot of you are nodding your heads, and it's true. Curiosity is like a life elixir. There's data that shows that, that curiosity, for those who, who live to a, for a very old age, like Peter Drucker, management theorist, it lived to mid-90s because he absolutely focused on being curious his whole life. Well, being curious in a tech company as a non-tech person, the first thing I had to focus on is just admitting what I didn't know and asking great questions. For many of us, the older we get, we're supposed to actually feel like we know all the answers. But the truth is, the wisest amongst us are the ones who ask great questions. So I got the reputation pretty early on as not the guy in the room who's twice the age of everybody else who's going to have all the answers, but I was the one who had the insightful questions. And I would constantly ask those questions. So being curious and constantly curious is a form of being a modern elder. Secondly, and many of us are very familiar with this, um, is that many, many, many people who are younger than us, half our age in my case, in my company, 
are exceptionally digital savvy. They have a gadget. They know how that gadget works. They are going to grok and understand their gadget better than I ever will. But they're so digital savvy, they are not emo savvy. Emo savvy, emotionally savvy. And that is an opportunity for you or for those who you work with to be a modern elder. Because one of the things that is getting lost generationally is a collection of people who are much more intimately involved with their device than they are with the human right in front of them. And being able to intuitively walk into a room and understand the temperature, the emotional temperature in that room, or be able to understand the hierarchy of needs of the person sitting right in front of you, that is something that our generation and those older than me can teach a generation or two behind them. Thirdly, the older you are, hopefully, the better read you are, the more well-read and well-connected you are. I can never be as good as Google in terms of being able to give you all the different options of how somebody can actually find and research something. But I can customize a solution for someone. When someone is coming into the office and we're having a meeting, I just had a meeting like that at Airbnb on the way here. And I said, here are three books and one research paper and one person you should go talk to that I have learned over the course of being a little bit older than you. I've collected a bunch of knowledge, but a lot of contacts that I can pass on to people. So I think being a modern elder is being constantly curious, being emo savvy, and being well-read and well-connected, and helping actually those younger than you actually feel that as well. For those who feel like Airbnb is only a millennial thing, um, I will just sort of finish up my talk by start talking about the fact that it's not. That's the part that's been fun over the 25 months I've been there, is yes, it started for millennials. It's predominantly a millennial employee base. The three founders are millennials. And yet, our fastest growing demographic in the world today is Mike and Debbie Campbell, who were profiled in the New York Times, major story in the New York Times, Sunday uh, section three weeks ago, or three months ago. They've got, they have gone for a year and a half now, they're from Seattle, a year and a half all around the world, staying at 50 different Airbnbs with, pe with people around the world. Why are they doing that? Because frankly, they have time. One of the things, you know, life is all about scarcity, and it's scarcity of time, scarcity of money. They were starting to get worried about their scarcity of money, which a lot of people who are you know, 50, 60s, and 70s should if they're going to live to 100. And so they said, we want to go out and experience the world, but we want to do it affordably. And we can go and stay in a neighborhood for a week or two weeks or three weeks at a time. So Airbnb, as a place where people open up their homes, was an alternative to them. And then the other piece of the Airbnb story that's really interesting around people who are getting older is the fact that we're a hospitality company. Uh, we're in the business of being a host. And what we know is that there are empty nesters all over the world. This is a Korean couple. Uh, they have a three-bedroom home in Seoul. Uh, they uh, basically, when the kids moved out, they actually had to make the decision. Are we selling the family home that we've lived in for 25 years and downsizing, or are we going to become an Airbnb host? And they chose the latter. And so what they have found Airbnb to be, and I'm, this sounds like way too much of a sales pitch for Airbnb, and that's not what I'm here for, so I'm going to finish it in a second on that. But what's fascinating about it is here's a, an indus, here's, a, here's a business that people have sort of seen as it's a millennial thing, it's just a tech thing. At the end of the day, this couple, and I stayed with them in, in, in Seoul, they, what they love is they love the fact that they get to stay in their home the rest of their life. They love the fact that while they're not at a stage in their life where they're going to travel as much as they did when they're younger, they have people from all over the world coming to stay with them. Two-thirds of Airbnb travelers are international travelers. So they get to, know, get to meet people from all over the world. And they actually, it keeps them both emotionally and intellectually uh, engaged. So just to sum up, there's a lot of companies out there that are using Maslow's hierarchy of needs quite consciously in how they operate. This is a collection of companies that I'm aware of. Um, for those of you who said, that was way too much information, not, no, you know, not enough time, that's the book I wrote a few years ago called Peak, How Great Companies Get Their Mojo from Maslow. Um, basic premise is if you create peak experiences for people, uh, it takes you and creates a more differentiated and loyal connection with them. Um, 
So I hope you will all seek the peek. And I'm going to now open it up and see if there's just a couple questions, two questions maybe. Thank you very much. Thank you.